Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to take a, a few minutes this afternoon to talk about the university, uh, some things that are going on here, some things that I think will be going on in the year ahead and, and even beyond. Um, this is the, the time of the year when I think a lot about history, history of the institution, um, and even history more broadly. And here's what I mean by this. Uh, we start the academic year by welcoming our new students. That is the class of 2019, 18-year-olds. Um, and I ask them to imagine uh, what it will be like when they come back for their 50th reunion, their 55th reunion, their 60th reunion. And I can think of that because a couple of days after I welcome them here on campus, I meet with those alumni, the five stars who are returning for their 55th and their 60th reunion. And I look at the accomplishments that those individuals have had over time. And I think about their dedication to the university. And then I go back to the class of 2019 and ask them to think about what it will be like in the year 2074 when they return for their 55th reunion or even 2079 when they return for their 60th. And I find myself thinking here at WNL that I'm on the cusp of really a hundred years of institutional history, looking back with the class of 1960 and 1955, and looking ahead with the class of 2019. But it's more than that, uh, that theme of history. It's more than that. Last Friday was the 150th anniversary of Robert E. Lee taking the oath of office as the president of Washington College 150 years ago. We kicked off that commemoration with David Brooks speaking on Thursday night on the future of higher education, a very appropriate theme given that Robert E. Lee, when he came here in 1865, thought very hard about the future of higher education. And then later this month, we'll hear from Jonathan Horn the author of a book on Lee called The Man Who Would Not Be Washington. So that 150th commemoration gives us a chance to think about the tradition of academic innovation that is so important here at Washington and Lee and how much that is Lee's legacy here at this institution. But it's even more than that. This year, the Mellon Foundation has given us $150,000, uh, a grant to spend some time developing courses, inviting speakers to campus, to think about history in the public sphere, and when it is appropriate or inappropriate to call upon history to help us understand contemporary events. And in giving us that grant, and in us asking the Mellon Foundation for that grant, we said that we cannot imagine an institution of higher education better able to think about the complexity of history than Washington and Lee University, because the arc of our history traces the arc of the history of this nation, from the founding, through the Civil War, through the Civil Rights era, and up into contemporary times. So among the things we'll be doing, in addition to the history department, creating some new spring term courses around that theme, Joseph Ellis, the historian of the American founding, will be our Founders Day speaker. Taylor Branch, the civil rights historian, uh, will be here in November to offer a lecture as well. So the theme of history is a big one for the year to come. But let me talk a little bit more about exactly what is going to be happening this year and how we're thinking about it. It is a transition year. I don't mean that in a personal way for me or Kim, although it surely is for both of us. But I mean it in, in terms of the institution's history. Uh, we are completing a strategic plan. As you know, we've completed our capital campaign very successfully. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But we're at the point where we're beginning to think about the next 10 years. Um, I think we've learned one lesson from this last strategic plan, among many other lessons. And that is that in order to accomplish something significant, it takes time and it takes thought, and it takes persistence. So we will be beginning to think about what the next 10 years will bring for Washington and Lee, and what the next 15 to 20 to 25 years will look like here at this institution. So let me spend a few minutes talking about where we are on several projects. 
how we got there, and uh, what lies ahead. And to do that, I want you to imagine with me a walk around campus for a few minutes. We've had a lot going on here the last few months, the last couple of years, by way of building projects. And a lot of that is coming to fruition right now, and we still have some to go, but, but come with me on a kind of imaginary walk. And we'll start at one end of Stemmons Plaza at Old DuPont Hall. And as you know, DuPont Hall has no redeeming architectural value. And we're going to go in and, and gut that. In fact, we have already done that to create new classroom spaces and new learning spaces for our students. But much more than that, we are putting an addition on behind that, and that whole complex is going to become the Center for Global Learning. Right behind the Hotchkiss Alumni House, right behind the Gillum Admissions House, and right at that end of Stemmons Plaza. So that our international education efforts, which have been strong, will now have a physical location um, in really bringing visibility to that aspect of our curriculum. That should be done January, maybe February, depending on a few things. Um, and we'll be having classes in there come winter term and spring term, faculty moving in at the end of this academic year. So let's leave the Center for Global Learning and start down the colonnade, that national historic landmark that we have in the last few years restored and renovated with great, great attention. That does have redeeming architectural value and very meaningful value for us. But the last remaining piece of the colonnade restoration is Tucker Hall. And Tucker Hall, come May, will be vacated. We'll have that construction fence, that very dignified construction fence, go up right around Tucker Hall. And the final piece of a dedicated colonnade project uh, will finally come to pass. And that colonnade will be restored so that 100 years from now, students and alumni will remember it in the same way we do today. So we go past Tucker Hall, past the colonnade, we keep walking, and then we'll take a little detour and go into Huntley Hall, the home of the Williams School, where we will open a new reading room uh, dedicated in honor of Larry and Fran Peppers. Larry, of course, was dean at the Williams School for 29 years, and he stepped down this year in at least one way we can help recognize his uh, remarkable tenure as Dean of the Williams School is to create a reading room, um, a renovated space where students can come together and collaborate on projects and do things that the Williams School has become known for, which is a lot of team projects, intensive work. Um, I can't think of a better way to honor his legacy there at the Williams School and the impact that he has had. So then we'll go back to that colonnade walk area and I want you to think for a minute of that, that walkway from Newcomb Hall back behind the Lee Jackson House and then in between the Lee House and Graham Lee's out onto Washington Street there. That is now all brick with lighting and it is now um, a pedestrian walkway rather than an asphalt and concrete passageway for vehicles. Um, it is a remarkable little addition that you might not notice right at first, but it, it really adds a great touch to that part of the colonnade. But more importantly, it opens up into a new first-year residential community. Graham Lee's has been totally renovated, and yes, it does have air conditioning. Uh, we're just going to have to find a different way to build character among our first-year students. Uh, but I'm sure we will find a way. And then that space between Graham Lee's and Gaines Hall has now been opened up into a great commons area. For those of you who lived in Gillum Dorm, as I did my freshman year, uh, Gillum Dorm is no longer. And that space between Gaines and Graham Lee's has created a brand new first year precinct. Um, and, and it's not just a renovation of Gaines and Graham Lee's. It's a way to think about that very important first year that our students have on this campus and the messages that we want to send to them about the close-knit nature of this community and the history of this community 
and how that class can really bond together during that first year. But there's another subtle aspect to this walkway that I mentioned and its opening into the first year community. And that is that it leads right into Wilson Hall and the Lenfest Center for the Performing Arts. That connection all the way from the Center for Global Learning across the colonnade, through the freshman dorms, and then out into the performing arts area is gonna link one end of the campus to the other end of the campus in a way that we haven't done to this point. And that was intentional. But now things really get interesting and I want you to continue this walk with me across the footbridge and out to where the law school is. In the law school, legal education is different. We teach the law in different ways than we have done in the past and that has meant the need for renovations uh, to Lewis Hall. And over the last two years, renovations to the library, to various classrooms there, uh, a very patient, careful uh, renovation to some key parts of Lewis Hall are now finally complete. It opened up this fall and they're ready to go. We go a little bit farther past the parking lot and into the other side of uh, where the law school parking lot is and that's where the new natatorium is under construction. That should be finished about a year from December or January a brand new aquatic center that will anchor one part of a very different uh, feature of, of that part of the campus. You go up the hill behind Wilson Field and there's a level field there that used to be a practice field. You go up another level by the Watt Field where soccer is played. And in that area is the creation of a new upper division housing neighborhood or a village, whatever you want to call it. There's a town center, there's an eating facility, there'll be a fitness center, all built to, uh, for townhomes and apartment buildings. That is well underway. And that will be available to this year's sophomore class at this time next year. It's remarkable to think that that will be happening, but it will be. And that neighborhood will bring students back on campus and again solidify the closeness nature of this community. Let me make a couple of points about everything I've, I've just mentioned. I do want you to imagine fall uh, next time, or this year next time, the Center for Global Learning will be finished, the housing will be finished, Tucker Hall will be underway, the natatorium will be mostly finished, a lot has been done in the last few years with the buildings here at Washington and Lee. All of the things that I've mentioned, with the exception of the housing, has been funded by donors for that purpose. In other words, we haven't drawn from tuition in order to do that. These are externally funded projects. They are the final pieces of what has been that seven to ten year strategic plan. They are the most visible at the moment, and frankly would be the most visible at any time during the strategic plan. But what the strategic plan has been, actually, has been far less about buildings and much more about the people at Washington and Lee, the faculty, the students, and the staff. So the larger priorities, both in terms of dollars and priority, and in terms of the timing and the sequence, has been to raise endowment for financial aid and to raise endowment for faculty compensation. The only other way to correct those deficiencies in our business model would be to draw from tuition. But in fact, we have done it here at Washington and Lee through contributions and through endowment. Um, so we are going to be celebrating the completion of a very, very successful capital campaign with very, very clear priorities. Um, as you know, we had a $500 million goal. We met that and, in fact, exceeded it and completed the campaign at $542.5 million um, to do many of these projects that I just mentioned. But behind those numbers, behind those priorities, and behind the success of raising those funds is this. It was the second largest campaign ever for a national liberal arts college. 
Our endowment is now at 1.45 billion, which on a per student basis puts us 25th largest in the country. And it has, going back to my point about tuition, enabled us to restrain tuition. Last year, um, on a percentage basis, our tuition went up 1.7%, the lowest it's been in 50 years on a percentage basis. Throughout this campaign, 77% of our alumni contributed, affirming the impact that this university has had on their lives and the confidence that they have shown in its future, and confidence that is well borne out by the success of the campaign and many other things that we've been able to do. We do have some remaining goals for this year. Uh, we still need to raise some money to complete the indoor athletic goal. About $24 million remains to be raised for the renovation of Doremus and the new Warner Center that has to go up. Financial aid endowment continues to be a need, as successful as we have been. Uh, we still uh, feel that is a priority in the years to come. Spring term and summer research opportunities. Uh, we know we're going to need some additional support in those areas as well to keep them as strong as they can be. And of course, the annual fund is an ongoing goal for us. Uh, we are now just over $10 million a year from the annual fund, with nearly 55% of our alumni, undergraduate alumni, participating in that. But unquestionably, this is a year when we are closing the books on a very ambitious strategic plan and beginning to think about what lies ahead, what challenges have emerged that now need to be met, and what new opportunities await the university. I want to turn um, attention for a few moments uh, to the academic year ahead. It's a pretty exciting one. And, and appropriately, let me call attention to um, some of the uh, innovations that we have in our academic area. And I say appropriately because, um, again, we're drawing upon that legacy of Robert E. Lee, who came in here after the Civil War and said, you know, we need to think about the curriculum. We need to think about some of the ways that we educate. Of course, then it was young men for a very, very different future that lies ahead. And so we continue to build upon that tradition. And let me mention just a few things of the many that I could mention. The, the Shepherd Poverty Program, as a result of the capital campaign, that is now fully endowed and very much a part of the fabric of this institution. Um, it is the largest minor on our campus. Many students from many majors will minor in poverty. And they will spend the summer uh, doing internships out in the field, uh, working hands-on in areas that help them understand the challenge of poverty in our society. The Roger Mudd Center for Ethics. Last year, they did a year-long program on race and justice. This year, they'll be looking at the ethics of citizenship, speakers throughout the year, faculty working groups, student groups, to talk about the ethics of citizenship. The Larry Connolly Program for Entrepreneurship. Um, it's based in the Williams School, but it has attracted students from all over the college, um, throughout the university, to work on things like um, creating businesses, pushing forward a creative idea um, based on a business plan, based on a need that they see. Just a couple of weekends ago, we had the summit, the Entrepreneurship Summit, about 120 alumni returned to help with that. Nearly 400 students uh, participated in that two-day symposium, pitching business ideas, talking about how do you start a business. The Integrative and Quantitative Sciences Center over in the sciences, a very interdisciplinary way to look at the sciences. A lot of creative pedagogy, creative research space, all of that funded both by alumni contributions, but also the Howard Hughes Medical Institute um, gave us a million dollars to start that up. Digital humanities. Surprisingly, maybe in some ways, Washington and Lee is positioning itself on the forefront of how digital technologies help us teach better and help us do research better. And that is showing up in a program called the Digital Humanities, funded by the Mellon Foundation, 
uh, about $800,000 from them to support that. This year, too, a couple of other things. Uh, we are celebrating the LenFest Center's 25th anniversary, if you can believe that, and asking the theater and art and music departments to celebrate is like uh, opening the candy store to a bunch of kids. They're going to have a great time celebrating that very important anniversary. Um, and this also is the year for the mock convention. Um, our students will be looking at the Republican mock convention, and we all wish them a lot of luck in trying to choose, uh, predict who the Republican Party will choose as its nominee. Over in the law school, there's a very exciting program uh, where they have linked up with a group in Washington on the future of the Privacy Forum. Um, privacy is a huge area in legal circles and intellectual property circles, and there's a lot of close work between the law school and this very important project in Washington, D.C. As I look even further ahead in the years to come, I think the sciences will be receiving a lot of our attention. Um, the sciences are a strength here at Washington and Lee, in some ways a quiet and hidden strength, uh, but it is very important for the facilities there to keep up with the changes in how science is taught and how research is conducted. In no other area of our curriculum is the the line between research and teaching as blurred as it is in the sciences. I think we have come to the realization that you can't teach science anymore without having students conduct research along the way. And finally, let me end on a personal note. Uh, we have a very ambitious year ahead, even if it is a transition year, and maybe precisely because it is a transition year. And I personally have a very ambitious year ahead. There are still many things I want to do and still many things that I need to do to prepare for a successful move from one period to another. But clearly the other item on our agenda is finding someone to work with you in this position and to strengthen the university for the next decade and beyond. That person is going to be an extremely fortunate individual, not for all of the reasons um, I just mentioned, the, the success of the campaign, the projects we've embarked on, uh, the, the financial strength of the university, the academic quality of the university. Those will, of course, help the next individual. But really, that individual will be most fortunate because of the character of this institution the quality of the people who are here, the faculty and the staff and the students. Um, there is an extraordinary uh, repository of social capital at this institution. It is quite simply a strong community of very strong individuals. Uh, we are just very, very fortunate, and whoever follows me will be extremely fortunate. Um, I'll be traveling a lot in the weeks ahead, um, coming to alumni chapters throughout the country, mainly to thank all of you uh, for making this campaign and the strategic plan so successful and for positioning this university for a great future ahead. Along the way, I'll be thanking you personally as well. Um, it has been an honor and a privilege to serve in this position. And as I said, I still have a lot to do in the year ahead. Um, but I look forward to doing that and uh, making this university even greater than it is at the moment. Thank you all, and I look forward to seeing many of you um, in the months ahead.